Um, when I arrived at the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, one of my senior colleagues said there are two ways to look at this appointment. The first is that it's Einstein's Institute and you have to do something as important as Einstein. The second is you've just won the lottery. Uh, okay, so um, the, the subject I'm talking about is the stability of the solar system. This is a 200 year old uh, uh, painting of um, early mechanical model of the solar system. Uh, and I've put this up here just to uh, uh, demonstrate that this is a problem that's been around for hundreds of years and for all that time has fascinated uh, physicists and mathematicians, uh, the general public and even small children. Um, before starting on, on, on this, I want to give, remind you of uh, the system that we're talking about. Uh, the solar system has the Sun and eight planets starting at Mercury, going out through Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, this figure shows the planets to scale, but not the separations between them. On the scale that you're seeing here, the distance between the Earth and the center of the Sun would be about half a mile. Uh, on, the, uh, on the same scale, the distance between the Sun and Neptune, the outermost planet, would be about 20 miles. Uh, so the planets are really very far apart. Um, the solar system is also very isolated, again on the same scale. The distance to the nearest star uh, would be something like 100,000 miles. Um, the planets are also much smaller than the Sun, smaller in radius, as you can see from the diagram, and also much smaller in mass. Jupiter's only a, a thousandth of the mass of the Sun, and Earth is only a three hundredth of the mass of Jupiter. Um, the solar system has also been around for a very long time, four and a half billion years. S since the Earth goes around once per year, it means the Earth has gone around the Sun four and a half billion times. We're in early middle age, the system will last for about another seven billion years, at which point the Sun will exhaust its fuel, uh, start to expand before it uh, turns cold, and in the process um, uh, consume Mercury, Venus, maybe the Earth, but in any case will fry the Earth to uh, uh, a crisp. So that's a natural point of uh, uh, ending the discussion. Um, the, the, one, uh, the one piece of jargon I'm going to introduce um, is the astronomical unit. It's shorthand for the distance from the center of the Sun to the Earth, and it's about 93 million miles. So if you just remember that, that should be uh, uh, the only uh, technical term I'm using. Um, there's one ingredient of the solar system that wasn't shown in that diagram. Um, out beyond uh, Neptune's orbit, there's a belt called the Kuiper Belt containing a large number of small bodies similar to the asteroids up to a few hundred miles across uh, with occasional ones being much bigger. One of the biggest members is Pluto, which used to be thought of as a planet, but because of the similarity of uh, its size and orbit, to other members of the Kuiper Belt is now usually believed, considered uh, to be a member uh, of the belt rather than a separate planet. Um, the study of the, uh, uh, proper, the behavior of the solar system uh, dates back originally to Copernicus, uh, who showed that the sun rather than the earth uh, was the center of the system. This is one of his diagrams showing the sun and then Mercury, Venus, uh, earth, uh, with the moon going around the earth working out to Saturn, which was the last known planet, and then showing the sphere of the stars uh, symbolically behind it. After Copernicus uh, came uh, Kepler, who showed that the motions of the planets obeyed three empirical laws. Uh, one is that the orbit of each planet was an ellipse uh, with the sun at one focus. That is, the sun isn't at the center of the ellipse. It's at a geometric po point called the focus, which is off to one side. His other laws are that the line joining the planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas and equal times, which we now understand to be a result of conservation of angular momentum, and that the square of the period, orbital period, the time the planet takes to go once around, is proportional to the cube of its distance from the sun, which basically says that uh, the further away the planets are, the longer they take to go around. Earth goes around in one year. Uh, Jupiter takes uh, about 10, 10 or 12 years, Saturn <coughs> takes about 20, and, and, and so forth. Um, following Kepler, the, oh, just the, the other uh, term I'm going to introduce is because the orbits 
aren't circular because they're ellipses. The degree of ellipticity is specified uh, by the eccentricity, so it's zero if the orbit's a circle. And as the eccentricity goes up, the orbit gradually gets more elongated. The Earth um, is very nearly circular. Its eccentricity uh, is only between 1 and 2%. Um, the third uh, great contributor to understanding the solar system was uh, Newton. Newton discovered the law of gravity. He discovered the basic uh, laws of motion. And he was able to solve the equations for these laws for the simplified system containing the sun and one planet and showed that in that simplified system, the motion of the planet satisfied Kepler's laws, which uh, provided the theoretical basis and justification uh, for Kepler's empirical laws. Uh, Newton was, uh, for this, Newton was honored in many ways, but um, when the United Kingdom still had a, a pound note, Newton appeared on the pound note uh, with uh, elliptical planet orbits, but you'll notice that the engraver unfortunately put the sun at the center of the ellipse rather than at the focus <laughs> of the ellipse, uh, which, uh, which is where it should have been. So perhaps Newton was rolling over in his grave when, uh, uh, when this happened. OK, so with that introduction, the problem I'm going to talk about um, is extremely simple to state. Um, you have a point mass, which is the sun. It's surrounded by some number of much smaller uh, masses, which are the planets. They're on nearly circular orbits. They're nearly in the same orbital plane. And you just want to know if the configuration is stable over very long times, where very long times is up to 10 billion orbits. Remember that Newton was only able to solve uh, the problem with one planet around it. Once you get more than one planet because of his law of universal gravity, the planets are exerting small pushes and pulls on each other. And the question is whether those cancel out or eventually build up and uh, destroy the stability of the system. Why is this interesting? It is one of the oldest uh, problems in theoretical physics and one of the most important. Um, it's also interesting for uh, the reason that we'd like to understand what the fate of the Earth is. Basically, there are four choices for the way we'll end up. As I said, in seven billion years, the sun will exhaust its fuel, expand to a red giant, it'll heat the Earth to several thousand degrees, and maybe it'll swallow it. Or maybe before that, the Earth's orbit uh, or some other planet's orbit is unstable, and maybe they'll collide. Uh, or maybe the Earth's orbit is unstable and it'll fall into the sun. Or maybe the Earth's orbit is unstable and it'll have a close encounter with something like Jupiter or Saturn and it'll get flung out of the uh, system into uh, interstellar space. So all of these possibilities have been uh, thought about. Uh, this possibility uh, was addressed in uh, uh, this movie. Um, and. Um, more generally, the, the question of whether which of these uh, fates we would uh, have uh, was actually discussed by Robert Frost, the poet Robert Frost, in a very nice poem about whether the world will end in fire or, uh, uh, or, or in ice. And that's basically, you know, three of these choices are fire, one is ice, and it would be nice to know which one, uh, which one it's going to be. Um, we'd also like to learn other things. Why are there so few planets in the solar system? Why does the system have eight planets instead of 15 or 20 or 50? We believe the planets formed from a much larger number of uh, small bodies that collided and stuck together. I'd like to know why we ended up with eight. Um, there, the geological record contains a record of the temperature of the Earth uh, over millions of years into the past. And there's a very good reason to believe that many of those temperature fluctuations are due to periodic fluctuations um, in the amount of uh, energy we get from the sun due to changes in the Earth's orbit. And if we can understand how the Earth's orbit behaves, uh, we can calibrate the geological time scale much better than we can by other mechanisms. Um, we'd like to understand how dynamical systems behave over very long times. An example um, is the accelerator in Geneva, Switzerland, the Large Hadron Collider. It contains uh, protons traveling around uh, this uh, uh, large ring, uh, 10 or 15 miles in diameter, uh, for about 10 billion times. That's about the number of times the planets go around the sun. Um, and if you can understand how one system behaves over very long times, you may learn something about how the other one will behave 
over very long times. Uh, as you know, there have been thousands of extrasolar planets discovered, planets outside the solar system. We'd like to understand, if we can understand this, we may be able to constrain or understand better uh, the properties of uh, extrasolar uh, planetary systems. Um, and finally, there are even philosophical uh, uh, implications for understanding this problem. Um, so, for example, Newton thought about it, although he couldn't solve more than the two-body problem, he recognized that the, what happened when you had more than one planet was an interesting uh, question. Uh, his speculation was that blind fate could never make all the planets move in the same way in uh, nearly circular, near, near coplanar orbits. But he says there are some inconsiderable irregularities, and the belief from historians is that that represents irregularities like the small eccentricities that might have been due to the mutual planetary perturbations. And then he said, they could have arisen from the mutual actions of the planets upon one another, and which will be apt to increase until the system wants a reformation. Uh, this is interpreted to mean that he thought the system was unstable, that the um, uh, orbits of the, plane would, the planets would gradually become uh, more eccentric until they collided, um, but he took comfort in this because he felt that um, uh, his laws of motion had banished the need for God to uh, move the planets around, and by uh, stepping in and uh, recircularizing things, this provided the way for God to intervene in the world and uh, uh, continue to demonstrate his concern for uh, uh, humans. In other words, he thought that uh, God had a service contract uh, with the uh, solar system. Um, on the other hand, one of his contemporaries, Leibniz, who was already in fights with Newton about the invention of the calculus, uh, had this sort of catty comment that Newton and his followers have a very odd opinion concerning the work of God. According to their doctrine, God Almighty wants to wind up his watch from time to time. Otherwise, it would cease to move. He had not, it seems, sufficient foresight to make it a perpetual motion. So, you know, these guys obviously uh, didn't get along on a lot of things. Um, if you took a, any philosophy course, you probably recognize another comment on the solar system from Laplace a little later, that if you had an intelligence uh, who uh, was sufficiently great and you, he knew at a given instant of time all the forces in nature as well as the initial conditions of things, he could predict everything that was going to happen in the universe nothing would be uncertain, future and past would be present before its eyes. So this is a classic statement of what has come to be called Laplacian determinism, uh, the idea that you have no free will and that everything in the, the, everything in the world is entirely determined by its initial conditions and the laws of nature. Uh, since Laplace spent much of his career working on celestial mechanics and the behavior of the planets, it's quite clear that this philosophical point of view was inspired by the clockwork regularity of the solar system. And so the problem that we're discussing really is responsible for one of the important and extreme positions um, in the philosophy of free will and determinism. Okay, so that's the background to the problem. Um, how can we solve this? Well, many famous physicists and mathematicians have worked on the problem over the last uh, 300 years. Um, they've made a lot of progress, but only with very simplified model systems. And it's become clear that the only possible way to solve this problem is direct brute force numerical computation on fast computers of what the planetary orbits do over uh, a very long time. Um, we all know that computers have been getting much faster and more powerful, but this is still a difficult problem for several reasons. First, it, it is a long calculation to go the required few billion years. It takes many weeks uh, on even the, the fastest computers. Second, in the last decade, most of the speed ups in computers have been the result of parallelization, splitting up tasks so that many machines can work on it simultaneously. Um, this is one of the classic problems that you can't split up, that you can't parallelize, because you can't do the calculation from two million to three million years until you've finished the calculation from one million to two million years. So it has to be done on one machine, so parallelization doesn't help. Um, because you're calculating things for such a long time, you need very sophisticated algorithms to avoid numerical effects. Many uh, uh, approximate 
uh, methods for calculating what the planets do introduce a little bit of drag and so the orbits spiral in towards the sun which is completely unphysical and very bad for getting the right answer and even the standard computer arithmetic which carries 16 or 17 decimal digits um, is typically not precise enough to do this without building up round off error over uh, billions of years. Um, the, what the problem that you're looking at is uh, uh, very simple to specify. It's just Newton's law of gravity and Newton's laws of motion for the eight planets in the sun. If you're interested, the equation looks like this. There are some small corrections. These include the fact that the planets have satellites, that you really should be doing this with Einstein's theory of general relativity. You probably should include the largest few asteroids, but all of these are less than one part per million. They can easily be accounted for if you want to do a better calculation, so those aren't a problem. There are also some unknowns. Uh, there are a lot of small asteroids you can't include. As I mentioned, there are objects like in the Kuiper belt, and we can't count all of them. The sun is losing mass at a very slow rate. Um, there's a solar wind as the sun loses mass, and that drags on the planetary uh, the magnetospheres around the planets. There are other stars around, and those can introduce extra forces. There might be a star that passed close to the solar system sometimes in its history, but that's very unlikely. You don't know the planetary masses exactly, and so forth and so on. But you can go through all of these very carefully and show that all of these are uh, at the a level of less than one part per hundred million. Uh, they're important, but they're extremely small. And so to a very high accuracy, the solar system is isolated. It's a system where you understand the equations of motion. You understand the initial conditions. You understand all the masses. You understand all the parameters. And so if we go back to Laplace, uh, his extreme point of view doesn't apply to understanding people's psychology or whether or not what the economy is going to do. But it apply this particular point of view that if you know the instantaneous momentary positions, you can predict everything into the future or the past, actually applies extremely well to the solar system. So not surprisingly, this is exactly the sort of system where this simple view of the world um, works extremely well. Um, so you, people have now gone ahead and, and done this. Uh, this is an example. It shows only the innermost four planets. And it shows a stroboscopic picture where you take a snapshot of the system, uh, I think every 100 years, in this case, 50 million years into the future. So here's Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. You can see that the orbits are still pretty close to uh, circles. Um, this is a similar view uh, 7 billion years into the future. And you can see that it looks almost exactly the same. There's 50 million years in the past, uh, just after it was formed, four and a half billion years into the past. And again, it looks almost exactly the same. So the initial uh, conclusion from looking at this is that the solar system is stable. Its behavior over billions of years is really pretty boring. Problem solved, we can uh, go away and do something else. Um, but this, not, as it turn, this uh, turns out, is not true. Um, in order to explain what's uh, interesting, um, I have to give a little bit of background about dynamics and uh, dynamical systems. Crudely speaking, they can be divided into two kinds, regular and chaotic. The characteristic feature of a regular system is that it's very predictable, very well behaved. Chaotic systems are unpredictable and erratic. Mathematically, what this means is that if you have a regular system and you change the initial conditions, say, by an inch, then uh, uh, after a certain amount of time, that change will grow. It becomes two inches, double the, increase the time again, it'll become three inches, four inches, and so forth. In a chaotic system, the differences grow exponentially with time. So instead of one inch, two inches, three inches, it's one inch, two inches, four inches, eight inches, 16 inches. It's chaotic because uh, the, the changes are doubling in a fixed time instead of growing more slowly. And the difference between these is, is most easily seen in the case of sports. So for example, in baseball pitches, if you throw a ball through the air, its motion is very predictable, it's regular, and the whole game of being a good pitcher is trying to make it irregular, trying to make it more chaotic. Uh, if you go to a casino and play uh, roulette or dice, 
the whole reason that those work is that the motion of the ball in the, uh, uh, roulette, around the roulette wheel or the dice is extremely chaotic. And so you can't, no matter how carefully you throw the dice or send off the roulette wheel, you can't predict where it's going to end up. Um, weather is another example of a chaotic system uh, in the sense that you can predict what the weather's gonna be for a short period, uh, but not for a very long period. The classic uh, textbook example of a regular system is the pendulum. It's so well behaved that people use it to run uh, grandfather clocks, um, but it can also be used to illustrate uh, a chaotic system. So this is a, a lecture demonstration showing a uh, simple pendulum. Uh, a guy's hand is gonna come in and he's just going to start the pendulum going. You can see the motion is extremely well behaved and predictable. You could run a clock off it. Now he unscrews a screw that changes the pendulum into a pair of pendulums with the, second, the fulcrum of the second pendulum at the bottom of the first one. And now uh, lets it go again. In this case, you can see that the motion really is chaotic. If you don't think it's chaotic, try to predict the last time in this sequence that the bottom pendulum goes through uh, the top one. It's extremely difficult. If he tried it again, um, no matter how carefully he set it off, you would get completely different motion. It's a classic example of a chaotic system, and all you had to do was change it from a single pendulum uh, to a double pendulum. So chaotic systems are not you know, rare anomalies. They're, uh, uh, <laughs> they're everywhere. Okay, I think it's pretty much uh, finished. Okay, now we know that the orbits of the planets are regular. That's how come uh, we can predict eclipses. That's how come uh, we can send spacecraft to the other planets. Um, they're very well behaved uh, on short time scales. Um, but what we don't know is whether they're going to be very well behaved on long time scales. All of our uh, understanding and intuition about the planets comes from watching things for a few orbits, maybe a few hundred orbits. We know they're very well behaved on that time scale, but what happens if you go for a billion orbits? Um, and the, the surprising and remarkable thing that was found when people started carrying out these calculations is that over very long times, all the planetary orbits are chaotic. Um, and the time scale it requires for small differences to double is maybe a few million years. Now that sounds like a long time, but remember the system has been around for four and a half thousand million years. So there's been plenty of opportunity for this to operate. Um, an, a quantitative example of this is in this rather complicated plot. Um, what was done here is to calculate the motion of the planets, uh, the four outer planets for 200 million years. And then the guy, Wayne Hayes, um, took the initial position of one of the planets, I think Jupiter, and moved it by a millimeter, and then did the same calculation over again. Um, this plots the distance between the planets uh, in the two uh, calculations against the time in millions of years, and you can see that every 20 million years, the separation roughly uh, increases by about a factor of 10. So from 0 0.001 here, you go over 20 million years, it's up at 0 0.001. The scale here is not so important, except to notice that eventually the difference saturates. That's because the two planets and the two simulations are on the opposite side of the sun, and they can't get any further apart from that. The reason there are different curves here is simply that he tried doing the, the same thing over again with three different uh, uh, numerical codes. Uh, he tried it once with 53-bit pre precision, that is with words in the computer 53 bits long, did it again with 80 bits, the 80-bit one is more accurate, but the same characteristic uh, rapid growth is still there. So what this means is that when you start, if you started off and you moved Jupiter by a millimeter, uh, 150 million years later, it'd be on the opposite side of the solar system from where you would have expected. Um, now, you may ask, if, if the system is so chaotic, why did the orbits all look the same uh, here? The answer is that most of the chaos is kind of along the track of the planet. That is, it changes the orbital phase of the planet. It changes the time that uh, it reaches a point here, but it tends not to sh change the shapes of the orbits uh, much more slowly. Um, okay. 
So um, what are the conclusions uh, from this? Um, again, the important discovery is that all the planetary orbits are chaotic. That means that if you tr wanted to make accurate predictions of the positions of the planets, you can only do it for about 1% of the age of the solar system. Beyond that time, it's uh, completely unpredictable. So, for example, if somebody comes to you who's 100 million years old and wants you to cast their horoscope, um, you're not going to be able to do it because you won't be able to figure out what sign of the zodiac they were in when they were born. Uh, another way to think of it is that um, in, the, in coming to this lecture uh, you know, and, and driving across town, your mass had a sufficient tidal effect on Jupiter to change its position by, uh, from one side of the solar system to the other a uh, billion years from now. Uh, it sounds strange, but it really is true. Um, what that means is that since we can't predict things over very long times, we can only make statistical statements about, uh, about the future of the solar system. You can't say the system is stable or unstable. All you can do is run a bunch of calculations with small changes on the initial conditions and say, well, it's stable in most cases. Um, or it's unstable in most cases. You know, you can only make kind of statistical statements. Um, as I said, most of the chaotic behavior is in the orbital phases of the planets and their position around the sun, not in the shapes. Most, but not all, in particular Mercury, closest planet to the sun and the one that's most sensitive, does suffer changes in its shape. Um, and this is uh, most clearly seen in changes in the eccentricity. Remember I said the Earth had a very small eccentricity. Mercury has a much bigger eccentricity, around uh, 20%. And so um, what was done in this pretty picture is that uh, these guys calculated 2,500 systems. So basically they started off, they, did a, they followed the planets for five billion years, then they shifted Mercury in some random direction by a little bit, did it over again, and then they plotted the eccentricity of uh, uh, Mercury, and you can see there's all sorts of different random behavior. They all start at the current eccentricity of around 0.2, and some fraction of them uh, evolve up to extremely high eccentricity. Now, as the eccentricity gets bigger, the orbit gets more elongated, and above the dashed line, um, it's going to collide with Venus. So, in about roughly about 1% of the calculations these guys did, before the, uh, the sun uh, died, Mercury um, collided with Venus. In a smaller fraction, it missed Venus and collided with the Earth, but most of the time it uh, uh, collided with Venus. Um, and so the conclusion from that is that um, if you ask, is the solar system stable? The answer is, well, 99% of the time. The other 1%, it's not. That's the best you can do. Um, so the conclusion is that the solar system is actually, although Laplace thought of it as a clockwork universe, it's actually a very bad example of a clockwork universe because all you can do when you're talking about the answer to this question is to answer it in an approximate and statistical sense. Um, the other conclusion is that um, if Mercury is going to likely to suffer a collision uh, with Venus at some point in the future, at which point probably you'll be left with one planet, uh, then maybe this happened in the past. Maybe we had other planets in the solar system a billion years ago that then collided with Jupiter or Saturn or something else. Um, we have no way of knowing, but um, it's likely that, um, it's very likely that this happened uh, more than once in the past. Um, and that conclusion sort of leads me to the second uh, uh, theme of, uh, uh, of the talk, is the possibility of uh, dark planets. Um, we've agreed, I've said that the, the behavior of the orbits is chaotic. The chaotic nature of the orbits inevitably leads to uh, uh, planets on highly eccentric orbits that either collide with or suffer close encounters with the other planets. In the inner solar system, where Mercury might collide with Venus, because the planets are small and the orbital velocities are high, the typical result of one of these close encounters is going to be a collision that destroys one of the planets. In fact, we believe that that's how we got the moon, that there was another planet somewhat smaller than the Earth, maybe Mars size, that uh, was unstable 
had a grazing encounter with the Earth and knocked off a chunk of the mantle that eventually formed the Moon. In the outer solar system, on the other hand, the planets are much more massive, the orbital velocities are lower, so the typical response to a close encounter is that one of the planets gets ejected. Um, now, you can either, when you eject such a planet, it can either end up still orbiting in the solar system, but at a distance so large that it's undetectable, uh, or it can be ejected from the solar system completely and just end up wandering among the stars. That's a particularly appropriate fate because actually the word planet uh, comes from the Greek word for wanderer because the stars were fixed and the planets uh, moved among the stars. So an interstellar planet would really be a, 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 a wanderer. Um, so what I'd like to talk about a little is the possibility that there are still dark planets uh, undiscovered in the solar system. Uh, before doing that, I should just mention a little bit of the history because it's, it's somewhat relevant and very interesting. Um, there are actually two examples of uh, dark planets that we know of already. Um, the first was Neptune. Um, the planets that were known uh, to antiquity went out as far as Saturn. Planet Uranus beyond Saturn was discovered uh, by Herschel using a backyard telescope. Um, um, after that, um, people noticed that there were anomalies in the uh, uh, orbit of uh, uh, Uranus that couldn't be explained by, by Newton's laws. And in a very compl complex um, uh, analysis, uh, Le Verrier in Paris in 1846, uh, with some competition from uh, uh, Adams in, 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 the United, in, in England, um, explained these anomalies by the action of an extra planet and went so far as to predict where that planet had to be to explain those anomalies. Uh, so he wrote to um, uh, the director of an observatory and said, uh, I predict that a planet should be roughly here. Can you go and look for it? Uh, to his credit, the director of the observatory in uh, Berlin uh, took him seriously, went out and looked, and discovered it within an hour. Um, he discovered it within an hour because the prediction was so good that the actual planet was less than one degree from the predicted location. And this was, I think, a, an incredibly impressive achievement and was one of the achievements in the 19th century that really persuaded people that mathematicians and physicists really knew what they were doing. Um, the, the irony is that um, he didn't really quite discover the planet. This planet was actually discovered uh, by Galileo uh, more than 200 years before. Um, and the evidence for this is um, this small page from uh, Galileo's notebook. He was looking at the moons of uh, uh, Jupiter. So on this particular night uh, in 1619, I think, uh, he drew this di diagram which showed Jupiter and there was one moon, two moons, three moons, and he marked on the diagram the distance of the moons from Jupiter. And for a reference, he said, well, there's another star over here, which I'll call, call star A. And if you look with a modern uh, uh, ephemeris, uh, you can reproduce what things should have looked like on that particular night. And there's uh, Jupiter, there's one, two, three satellites there, and there's the, the star over there. However, you can also uh, plot on this where Neptune should, have be, should be. There's where it should have been. And in a little side note over here, he says, well, uh, the side note here, that beyond this fixed star here, uh, almost in exactly the same line, there's another star, which I also saw on the preceding night, but they seem to be further apart then. Um, never followed up on this, but uh, uh, he was there's where Neptune was. He clearly saw Neptune. And he clearly had a hint that it was a planet because it was moving relative to the stars. Why he didn't follow up on it, uh, nobody knows. Uh, it obviously would, you know, that, the idea at that time that there were extra uh, planets that hadn't been discovered was, would have been pretty strange. Maybe he had better things to do. I don't know. Maybe it was cloudy. I don't know. Um, okay, the, the second dark planet uh, was Pluto. Um, Pluto was searched for. Uh, by an American businessman and enthusiastic astronomer, astronomer called Percival Lovell. Uh, he was convinced that there were anomalies in the orbits of Uranus and, and Neptune, and that these were caused by another planet beyond Neptune. 
Uh, he was wealthy enough to found an observatory in uh, Flagstaff. Um, it searched for the planet over decades, starting in 1905. And finally, a young, uh, 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 basically a amateur, observe, amateur astronomer from a uh, farm in Kansas was hired um, and found Pluto in uh, 1930. He continued to look uh, for 14 more years, never found anything else. The irony is that um, by now we know that Pluto's mass is far too small to produce any of these anomalies. Uh, uh, and that in fact the anomalies in these orbits were probably due to slightly incorrect calculations because they were assuming the wrong value for uh, Neptune's mass. In fact, Pluto is now so small that there are other members of the Kuiper belt that are bigger and because its orbit and size are similar to uh, other objects in the Kuiper belt, it's generally classified as a Kuiper belt object rather than a planet. And of course, uh, last summer, uh, the New Horizons mission visited Pluto for the first time and sent back these spectacular images of the surface of Pluto and of one of its moons showing a much more varied and geologically interesting uh, topography than uh, most people had expected. Now Neptune and Pluto are not dark planets uh, in the sense that they were uh, cast out of the inner solar system. Oh, I should just say this um, Striping here is, is real, it's not an artifact. This is bands of dust in a very thin atmosphere. Anyway, so they weren't ejected by other planets. Uh, I just put them in because they're examples of finding planets, new planets, uh, by indirect uh, evidence. So the question is whether there are other dark planets beyond Pluto. We don't know of any, but they're very hard to find. The reason they're so hard to find, for example, is if you look at a planet like the Earth, it's visible only in the reflected light from the sun. Uh, so that means that if you take a, took a planet like Pluto or the Earth and you doubled its distance, uh, then the light it receives would go down by a factor of four. Then the light it would return would go down by another factor of four. So it would be a factor of 16 fainter. Worse than that, when you go a factor of 16 times fainter, there are 64 times as many stars of similar brightness. So the problem is not so much that it's too faint, it's that there are uh, vast numbers of other stars that you have a very hard time distinguishing uh, from the planet. The situation's not so bad for a massive planet like Jupiter because it's so big that it's still radiating off uh, the heat from its formation as it cools and contracts. That means it emits uh, radiation in the infrared. Uh, that's easier to detect, but NASA, NASA spacecraft, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, um, has now done a survey of the whole sky. It should have detected anything like Jupiter or Saturn out to about 30,000 astronomical units, 30,000 times the, the Earth-Sun distance. So uh, there might still be something in the very outer parts of the solar system, but it doesn't look like we've got a Jupiter out there. Um, given that we uh, haven't detected anything, you have to rely on indirect arguments uh, on, that make the existence of uh, such planets more plausible, and I'm going to discuss a series of five of these uh, uh, indirect arguments to, uh, uh, to let you assess the evidence for yourself. Um, the first, again, has to do with stability. Um, I've said that um, additional planets might have been ejected from the solar system in the past, um, and in this uh, 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 calculation, Matt, oops, sorry, Matt Holman, uh, decided he would go look. So what he did was simply put in the four giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then between them, he sprinkled hundreds of very small additional planets in hypothetical nearly circular orbits, and then just followed the whole system to see what would happen. Um, and uh, the vertical scale here is number of years, and there's a green dot whenever one of these extra planets uh, uh, was ejected from the system or collided with one of the giant planets. Um, the red dots are ones that survived until the end of the calculation here at the age of the sun. Here he stopped a little sooner. And you can see that between Neptune and Jupiter, essentially every planet he put uh, was gotten rid of. It either collided or it was ejected. So that says that the outer part of the solar system is basically full. If you had an extra planet, you couldn't, if you had a, you know, if you had a planet in your pocket, you couldn't stuff it in there and have it survive. 
Now, either that's a coincidence or the reason that, um, uh, that, that there used to be planets there and they've been lost. So this is sort of an indirect argument that it's very plausible uh, that extra planets might have been, uh, might have been ejected. Um, the, um, okay, the second argument, again, has to do with Pluto. Um, this is the old um, eccentricity diagram. Uh, Pluto actually has the higher eccentricity even than Mercury at around 0.25, a little more uh, eccentric than that. Um, and in fact, that's not the only thing that's funny about Pluto's orbit. Um, it has the biggest eccentricity. Uh, it has the highest inclination. I have to put planet in quotation marks because according to the International Astronomical Unit, it's no longer a planet. But the most peculiar property is that because of its high eccentricity, it actually crosses Neptune's orbit. So between 1979 and 1989, um, it was actually closer to the sun than Neptune was. Well, that means that Pluto's crossed Neptune's orbit millions of times during the lifetime of the solar system. And you know, if you have two guys going to work every day and they cross at an intersection and neither one obeys the stop sign, um, eventually there's gonna be a collision. And so one of the real puzzles when Pluto was discovered was uh, how it avoided colliding uh, with Neptune. Um, the answer turns out to be a resonance. If you look at the orbital period of Pluto, the time it takes to go once around the sun, the orbit about 250 years, Neptune's around 165 years, the ratio of those two is exactly 1.5 or three to two. That means that Pluto goes around Neptune, uh, sorry, Pluto goes around the sun twice for every nep time, three times Neptune goes around. And what that means is that they can always avoid each other. Um, that's most easily seen um, by looking in a rotating frame that's centered on Neptune. Uh, so this frame is going around with Neptune. Neptune wiggles back and forth a little bit uh, because of its eccentricity. The other planets go around because they are going around at different rates. And Pluto forms this curious rosette figure. And you can see that every time Pluto is close to the sun uh, around here, it's around 90 degrees away from Neptune. It never uh, comes close to Neptune. So that explains why they don't collide. What it doesn't explain is how it got into this uh, strange orbit, because it has to be very precisely tuned to be exactly in this resonance. Um, the answer to that was uh, provided by uh, Renu Malhotra at the University of Arizona. Um, she pointed out that, as we said, early in the history of the solar system, there probably were additional planets and smaller debris left over between the giant planets. When you eject that, those planets because of conservation of energy and angular momentum. Uh, the planets that eject them move in and out. Turns out that in this case, Neptune moves out. It's called a migration. Um, and if Pluto started off initially in a circular orbit outside Neptune, as Neptune migrates out, it turns out that it inevitably captures Pluto in the three to two resonance. Um, you can see that in these uh, numerical simulations. This is uh, in which Neptune has been artificially pushed outwards Here's Pluto, the period ratio between Pluto and Neptune slowly decreases as Neptune moves out until they reach the 1.5, one 3 to 2, and then Pluto's locked in resonance. Neptune continues to move out and Pluto's orbital radius increases, its eccentricity goes up and its inclination goes up. So all of the funny features of Pluto's orbit, the high eccentricity, the high inclination, the 3 to 2 resonance, are all inevitable and natural consequences of the idea that Neptune migrated outwards and therefore uh, that it, the reason it was migrating outwards was that it was ejecting bodies into the outer uh, solar system. This model also makes a prediction. It says that Pluto is probably not unique, uh, that other objects might have been captured in the resonance as well, um, and that turns out to be true. This is a snapshot of all the bodies in the outer solar system as of March 13th, provided by the Minor Planet Center. Um, the blue objects are comets, which are only seen when they're close to the sun. Here's Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. The red objects are objects in the Kuiper Belt outside Neptune. The reason there are these funny streaks is that some of them were discovered by narrow surveys that only looked in a particular direction, and they haven't had time to spread out since the survey was done. There's Pluto. And all the white objects are Kuiper Belt objects that are locked in the same three to two resonance with, uh, 
uh, Pluto. They're now called Plutinos, but the fact that there are so many in the same resonance tells you, just as Malhotra predicted, that capture into the resonance wasn't a unique one-off uh, uh, extraordinary occurrence. It was inevitable for anything in that part of the solar system. The third indirect arg argument comes from comets. Uh, many of us, I don't know how many of you have seen comets, but they can be uh, uh, quite beautiful. This is a picture of, the, of a particular comet taken by the European Rosetta mission uh, last year, showing the, the, the nucleus, the sort of solid chunk that's at the center of the, the, the comet. Uh, the com although the comet itself is a chunk a few, few miles across, it's visible because of these tails of gas and small particles that are evaporated by the comet as it's heated by the sun. Um, because you're seeing all these, these beautiful tails, it means material is being lost from the comet. Once the comet comes close enough to the sun to be visible, it can't survive for very long because it's losing all this uh, stuff. So typically, uh, comets don't survive more than a few hundred orbits. That means that most comets have to be in a kind of cold storage reservoir, some region of the solar system that's far enough from the sun so that uh, they stay cold, uh, but still close enough that they're getting churned up enough so that they slowly drain into the inner uh, solar system. We know of two reservoirs. The first is the Kuiper Belt. The second is the Oort Cloud. Um, the Kuiper Belt, you'll remember, is out here beyond Neptune. And you can see now why we're seeing comets from the Kuiper Belt. Many of the orbits of these uh, small bodies in the Kuiper Belt are unstable on time scales comparable to the age of the solar system. The red ones are ones that are stable, the green that are unstable. So you can see that most of the orbits survive, but some of them are continually uh, being uh, perturbed onto unstable orbits, some of which come into the inner solar system so that we see them as comets. Um, the Oort cloud, in contrast, is, a, is at a much larger radii. Instead of the Kuiper belt at maybe 50 astronomical units, it's at around uh, 50,000. It contains something like 100 billion comets. Um, and in this case, the comets are slowly being drained out of the Oort cloud because the gravitational forces from passing stars kick them onto orbits that come uh, close to the sun. This is a remarkable theoretical construct because we have, we've never seen a comet uh, in the Oort cloud. We never see comets unless they're close to the sun, but the evidence for it is extremely solid. Uh, basically, if a comet falls in towards the sun from the Oort cloud, it's still on an ellipse, but an extremely elongated one, the long axis, half of the long axis of the ellipse, it's called the semi-major axis. And what's been done here is simply to plot the distribution of the semi-major axes of comets uh, that we see coming into the uh, close to the sun, because there's so much volume in semi-major axis out at the Oort cloud, they've plotted one over the semi-major axis. So there's 1,000 AU, 2,000 AU, 10,000 AU. If it becomes negative, that means that it's on a uh, escape orbit that's just falling into the sun for the first time. And you can see this extremely strong peak at uh, distances between about 10,000 and maybe 50,000 astronomical units. Um, that peak there, which we're observing directly from orbits of comets, has to be due to some cloud out there, and the cloud out there is the Oort cloud. So the, almost all of the properties of the cloud were predicted by Oort back in 1950. He was a very um, able Dutch astronomer, and he made the extrapolation from, at the time, I think seven comets with good orbits to an Oort cloud uh, uh, with 100 billion uh, comets. This is a bigger extrapolation than most of us would normally feel comfortable making, but he was, as far as we can tell, he was completely correct. Um, okay, we know that comets can't form in the cloud because such objects can only form where there's a, enough material in a dense enough state uh, to, to coalesce, and that means they had to have formed in the regions of the giant planets. That means in turn that they had to be ejected by interactions with the comets into the cloud. Numerical simulations show that the efficiency of transporting comets from the region of the giant planets to the Oort cloud is a few percent. And so, of course, if you can eject comets into the cloud, 
Uh, a big planet doesn't care whether it has an encounter with a planet, comet or a small planet, so why not planets? So it would be natural to assume that uh, uh, if you've got 100 billion comets in the Oort cloud, you probably should have uh, a few planets. Um, the um, second last piece of evidence is uh, Sedna. It's uh, a body in the uh, uh, Kuiper belt that was discovered uh, about 10 years ago. These are the discovery images, just to show you how hard it is. Uh, you can see that it's discovered by the fact that it's moving slightly compared to all the fixed stars, but that uh, tells you why it's not so easy to find these things. The thing that's exceptional about Sedna is that its whole orbit is well outside the orbits of all the planets. Its furthest approach from the sun is almost 1,000 astronomical units. Closest approach is 75 astronomical units, about twice the distance of Neptune. Because it's so big, it's got an orbital period of over 10,000 years. It's about 1,000 kilometers in diameter. So it's almost as big as Pluto. It looks like a planet, you know, and it was almost practically impossible to see. There are a handful of other examples known by now, but, uh, and, but we're only seeing it because it happens to be close uh, to the sun at the moment. Most of its orbit, it would have been completely invisible to us. So it's almost inevitable that there are additional objects like this or somewhat bigger that have been ejected into similar orbits. Um, the final example <coughs> um, is, comes from a study that was in the news just uh, uh, a couple of months ago. Um, a couple of astronomers at Caltech uh, noticed that if you looked at a sequence, a series of the most distant objects in the Kuiper belt, that they weren't oriented at random around the, the, the sun, that most of the long axes of their orbits were uh, concentrated in a, in a quadrant of, uh, of the sky in one direction from the sun. One of them is Sedna, but there's a handful of other ones. Um, and they argued that that concentration wouldn't survive for the lifetime of the solar system unless it was being uh, actively maintained, and that um, the concentration could be maintained by the gravitational field from a distant planet. They required that the planet uh, have a, a mass of around 10 or 20 Earth masses, a distance of around 1,000 astronomical units. Um, so my personal view of this is that it's a very interesting speculation. Uh, it's hardly a prediction uh, comparable to Leverrier's prediction of Neptune. Remember, Leverrier got the position of Neptune to within a square degree, and these guys can only predict it within about 10,000 square degrees or a quarter of the sky. So they haven't done a, they don't understand things well enough uh, to make a real prediction of the location of a planet. This might or may not uh, be the right explanation for this concentration. You'd like to see better statistics on the concentration, but it's yet another piece of circumstantial evidence that uh, uh, maybe um, maybe these comets, uh, may maybe these uh, extra planets uh, are out there. Um, okay, since time is getting on, <coughs> uh, I'm going to uh, uh, try to wrap up. Um, I think we now can answer the very old question of the stability of the solar system, but we can't, um, <coughs> we can't answer it exactly. We can only answer it in a statistical sense. The reason for that is that the orbits of the planets are chaotic. Uh, small changes, any small change that you make doubles a thousand times during their lifetimes. Uh, the statistical uh, statement we can make is that uh, uh, there's about a 1% chance that we'll lose one or more of the planets uh, before the sun dies. That means that with a 99% uh, chance, um, the world will probably end in fire and not in uh, ice. Uh, it's likely that um, planets have been ejected to large distances or lost from the solar system in the past. Um, it's likely that uh, dark planets remain to be discovered in our solar system. It's equally likely that planets have been ejected from the solar system and are now traveling between the stars. You may th say, well, that's a pretty uh, unpleasant place to be, but in fact, there are models of uh, uh, planetary atmospheres and interiors where you could maintain a habitable environment uh, with liquid water on the surface 
uh, heated by the internal heat of the planet and kept from radiating to space by an extremely thick uh, greenhouse uh, atmosphere. Um, so um, I'm happy to take questions, uh, but while we, while we have that discussion, I'll just put up a graph that summarizes our understanding of the possible location of uh, extra planets in the solar system. Uh, this comes from the, the cartoon XKCD. Uh, it has uh, the Oort cloud, dwarf planets, uh, airplanes, uh, uh, bugs, space junk, comets, asteroids, stuff we can see through telescopes, and plenty of things to keep you occupied if uh, you're not asking questions. OK, thank you. <coughs> Maybe I'll just let you select after sure. a few minutes. Sure. Um, in the standard models of dark matter, the density of dark matter is so low uh, compared to the, the level of, uh, is, is sufficiently low that its effects uh, on <coughs> everything we can think of are completely negligible. Um, there has been, uh, well, um, yes, actually, I did, I did calculate that once. Um, there has, there has been some recent work by the Harvard physicist Lisa Randall suggesting that there's an extra component of dark matter that's formed a very thin, dense disk. And she's just written a popular book arguing that, basically arguing that dark matter might have killed the dinosaurs because uh, the dark, this thick dark disk would have perturbed the Oort cloud periodically in one of those showers of comets produced by that perturbation might have led to the impact at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary that killed the dinosaurs. This is somewhat speculative, as you can imagine, but the reviewers say it's a good read, so there you go. Yes? What do we know about changes in the orbit of the moon around the Earth? Um, quite a bit, but um, those changes are driven by uh, tides from the Earth. So the um, <clears throat> the energy that's dissipated in the daily tides is basically taken out of the spin of the Earth and the, the, the orbital energy of the Moon. Um, that means that the Earth is slowing down as a result and the Moon is receding from, from the Earth. So the belief is that the Moon started off much closer to the Earth in the distant past and has been gradually receding throughout the history of, uh, 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 throughout the, history of the Earth. Um, eventually, it will get sufficiently far away as this process continues that the day and the month will be equal. The same face of the Earth will always face the Moon the same way that the same face of the Moon always faces the Earth. And at that point, it will be far enough away that it is susceptible to uh, possible changes in its orbit from other planets. But so far, the influence has been almost entirely, the evolution has been almost entirely due to the tides. Um, it, it's believed that the moon was formed shortly after the Earth was formed, so it started close to the Earth four and a half billion years ago and has been steadily uh, receding since then. Yes? In one of your early slides, there was an extrapolation out of seven million years. You were looking at the orbits of the four planets. Mm -hmm. um, has anyone studied the Earth's, the eccentricities of the Earth's orbit and what, what the effects are? Um, so, so the, these calculations have the changes in the Earth's eccentricity, um, and the eccentricity has, has been oscill always oscillates, and the oscillation in the eccentricity is one of the reasons for periodic climate changes on timescales of hundreds of thousands, uh, hundred thousand years, or so. Um, those oscillations don't really look any different, as far as we can tell. Uh, five billion years into the future. What's more of a concern for, for the ecosystem is that uh, the sun is gradually warming up uh, and getting slightly bigger during that course as the sun evolves and starts to lose fuel. So um, there will be a change in the ecosystem, 
but it's mostly the fault of the sun rather than changes in the sun rather than changes in the orbit. Yes. How big an asteroid would it take to start a, a instability in, in the Earth's orbit and a future collision in a much shorter time frame than predicted for these um, quite large. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, I mean, the real problem of this, of course, is that any asteroid bigger than about 10 or 20 kilometers is sufficient to cause catastrophic climate change on the Earth. Um, if you survive that, um, you know, you would need an asteroid probably you would need to have one of the biggest few asteroids hit the Earth, which is extremely improbable, just because you know, the mass of the Earth is billions of times the mass of the asteroids. So the real problem with the asteroids is um, the effect on the environment of the impact rather than the effect of the impact on the orbit. So the, so the asteroid that landed in the it, it No, it, did, it, it was, by those standards, it was tiny, but uh, I mean, the, the, the basic thing is that the velocities in the solar system are so large that um, the energy contained in the, um, the kinetic energy when the thing hits is huge. So if you had a choice of, <clears throat> you know, a, a nuclear, an atomic bomb of a given mass that you just left on the Earth or an asteroid, the same mass hitting it, the asteroid would do more damage than a bomb of the equivalent mass. So there's a lot of energy there. Yes. This must be, this is not such a scientific question, but uh, does human activity affect what happens in the universe or our solar system? Like you touched on it a little bit, but then you said it's too complicated or something. For example, uh, let's say humans destroy the Earth before anything else does. Would that affect the Earth itself? Well, so <clears throat> because of the chaotic nature, at least in principle, things we do on Earth can affect the positions of the planets. Um, but from a practical point of view, it's very difficult for us to do anything that um, uh, affects uh, any of the astronomical objects in the solar system. That's one of the reasons astronomy is such a nice science, right? Because no matter what we do, we can't possibly screw anything up. <laughs> uh, you know, if we don't understand the sun correctly, it's not going to make it change its luminosity, right? So there's nothing we can do that's going to hurt anybody. So it's very uh, relaxing. Um, no, it's, it's quite common. Um, I'm not going to be able to give you the names of all of them, but most of the moons that are relatively close uh, do, um, are synchronized so that one face is always uh, towards, the, towards the planet. Mm -hmm. So typically in the diagram, all the planets are shown in the same plane orbiting. Is there an explanation why we have three? Um, yeah, basically it's because um, if you have a bunch of stuff around, uh, around something like the sun, um, <clears throat> when it interacts, it has to conserve its total angular momentum, but it can dissipate energy. So it can't all fall into the sun because then it wouldn't conserve its angular momentum. So if you ask, if I conserve the angular momentum and I try to make, put everything in the lowest energy state that I can, it's going to be a flat ring. So it, you know, there are dozens of different kind, completely different kinds of systems in astronomy, uh, accretion disks, Saturn's rings, um, and they're all flat. About two months ago, there was a study that uh, two astronomers, I think it was like Caltech, supposedly found in the ninth planning. Do you think that has any concrete evidence or anything? Um, that, that was the, the study I was referring to, uh, let's see, back here. Um, oops, sorry. Um, based on the, the, um, <clears throat> the fact that these orbits were concentrated into one quadrant. I think it's an interesting speculation. It might be true. I'd like to both get... Um, better statistics on the distribution of these uh, objects 
and think hard about all possible alternatives. Um, so, you know, I think it's another piece of circumstantial evidence that uh, there might be planets out there, but I don't think it's a, I wouldn't count it yet as a secure prediction of a, a new planet. Yes. You spoke about the truncation effect of 53 digits versus 80 digits. Can you speak a little bit to the uh, computational stability of the algorithm that's used to interpret the Newtonian uh, equations? Um, sure. So um, there, there have been studies of this. And you can't prove any theorems about it. But um, the most careful studies take a particular set of equations and they integrate it, they, you know, they follow it on different machines with different algorithms, you know, different programs. They try to do three or four different programs and see if the results look the same. Now, it's very hard to say that, to define precisely what it means for the results being the same because the system is chaotic, so any small differences uh, do affect things. But in any parameter that they've been able to look at, uh, they can get exactly the same behavior uh, with uh, several different high quality algorithms. And so, you know, I think most people would say that that's a sufficient test and that the algorithms are, are, are reliable. But it, it's a very reasonable thing to be concerned about. Um, I remember hearing about a recent earthquake that the Earth's axis was skewed by in some very, very small degree. Um, what does that have to do with uh, the chaotic? Um, <clears throat> Nothing directly for the Earth. Um, it has a lot more to do with the behavior of some other bodies. So in particular, Mars, um, as a result of the effect, the forces from the other planets, its, um, its spin is chaotic. So over periods of hundreds of thousands of years, the orientation of Mars's uh, pole wanders around erratically, and there's some reason to believe this is responsible for some of the complicated geological structure that you, you see on Mars. Uh, but actually, because of the moon, uh, that stabilizes the Earth's uh, spin axis. And so our spin axis is actually quite, behaves quite regularly. There are changes in the axis due to, caused by, by, by the moon and the sun. Those are one of the causes of these long-term periodic variations in the climate but the changes are periodic and, and, and well behaved with no evidence of chaos. Within the observable universe, is there any evidence of other system that is unstable or information about its stability? Um, that's, well, <clears throat> that's an argument that a lot of people make, but they usually make it in the opposite sense when people look at extrasolar planetary systems, they say, well, we see a system, for example, with planets in particular positions. We don't know what the masses are, but if the masses were too big, the system would be unstable, so we can get an upper limit on the masses. So in practical terms, the argument is usually turned around the other way. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion of the causes of why most of the atmosphere and water on Mars um, that, that's pretty far outside my area of expertise. Um, one of the things that I think is quite unclear is one of the reasons that's a difficult question to answer is that it's quite unclear how much water there is on Mars. Um, there's evidence that um, if you get, a, say, a small meteorite impact, that temporarily, when it, that clears out fresh terrain, that there's ice visible in the terrain. And so it may be that there's actually large amounts of ice buried some meters uh, underground and frozen. Um, but the particular reasons why the Earth's history has been different from the history of Mars, I think nobody really understands. And if they do, if some people do, then I'm not one of them. Yes. When the sun ultimately dies and casts off its outer shell, I assume that gravitational forces will ultimately shrink what's left into a white dwarf. Like, mm -hmm. What would ultimately happen to the orbits of the outer planets? 
Um, so <clears throat> the sun would first expand, would swallow Mercury, swallow Venus. At the same time, it's losing mass because in that stage of the lifetime of the, the stars, they typically lose a lot of mass. As it loses mass, the orbits of the planets would expand. So for, for the Earth, if there's something of a race, that is, is there's a competition between the mass loss from the sun making its orbit expand and the sun itself expanding. And I think nobody's really quite sure what the outcome of that race will be. Either the Earth would be swallowed by the sun, like Mercury and Venus, or else it would survive, but as a cinder. Um, the outer planets would certainly survive. When the sun turns into a white dwarf, it lo typically loses a lot of mass, maybe half of its mass. So they would move out, and in response to that, their orbits would expand. So you'd be left with a white dwarf with uh, um, uh, a few outer planet, giant planets at very large distances. Now, one of the things that we don't understand is that if you look at other white dwarfs, very compact uh, <clears throat> dead stars, in a lot of cases, there's very strong evidence for planetary material close to them. Uh, basically, the evidence is that you see excess infrared light around the, the white dwarf, which might be due to uh, debris that's re-radiating the light from the white dwarf. You also see pollution on the surface of the white dwarf from heavy elements that must have come from material outside the white dwarf. Now, how that material got there and how it survived the earlier stages of, uh, uh, in which the star died and was much larger, nobody knows. But there's a remarkably strong evidence that there is planetary material to make planets, if not planets, uh, close to many white dwarfs. And nobody knows why. Well, I'd say that I can see there's still a lot of questions, but maybe let's thank the speaker. And then those of you with questions can come down to the podium. Thank you.